welcome you to the Gwinnett Environmental and Heritage Center. Uh, my name is Steve Cannon. I'm the executive director. Uh, and I am just so blessed because I get to come here every day. And uh, I want to encourage you to take a walkabout uh, after the program today. We've got several tours. Um, our primary customers are about three feet tall. And if you hear some noise in a little bit, it's them. They're, they're moving throughout the center. Um, and today, uh, it is my honor uh, to uh, welcome you, but not only that, to introduce our chairman, uh, Charlotte Nash. Chairman Nash has a diverse background. Uh, she has uh, owned her own business. Uh, she has served as 27 years as a, as a county staff employee, of nine of which were the county administrators. So she's had some uh, good, bad, and ugly with all that that is. And, uh, but more importantly, she probably uh, has helped lay the groundwork for this center today. She and Chairman Hill were instrumental in the development and construction of what you see here today, which is all about what we're here to talk about today, sustainable design and conservation. Uh, this is a, um, a LEED certified building. It's a gold. And, and at the time, there were, this was cutting edge. There were no building codes when we started this to, to, to support this. So her leadership in this has just been instrumental in getting this thing uh, where it is today. Uh, Charlotte is active in a numerous of both civic and business organizations and uh, supports the community through a lot of volunteer effort. Uh, the Atlanta Business Chronicle named her one of the, uh, one of the most 100 influential uh, Atlantans uh, for 2011, 2012, and 2013. Uh, Georgia Trend, who I think is here today, has also uh, named her one of the most 100 influential Georgians. So, um, Charlotte and her husband, Michael, live in the Decula Harbins area. Uh, she is a graduate of the University of Georgia with honors. There you go, I knew it was coming. Um, she has um, been married for 41 years, has two grown children and two grandchildren. And without further ado, I welcome Charlotte Nash, our chairman. You know, driving over here today, um, it, it struck me that this gathering is exactly the type of thing that we had in mind for this place to serve as a location, a venue for when we were conceiving the idea of the Environmental and Heritage Center. Now, you might say, what, what's, what's the connection between environment and heritage? Besides the fact that we couldn't decide which, whether we wanted to uh, focus on environment or, or history. But uh, it really is water as the unifying theme. Water has had such a, a, has been such a force in both forming the, our world, affecting our world, but also on human beings. I mean, you think of river valleys as the cradle of civilization. Uh, there have been uh, battles and wars fought over water. And while the battlefield has changed, we feel like we're probably still doing some of that, don't we, Boyd? Uh, uh, but this, we really visualize this place as, as a way, a place to educate uh, uh, primarily the audience of the Gwinnett County, but, but also broader across North Georgia, folks about um, the importance of water, um, the fact that water is not an infinite resource, but that we have to use appropriate stewardship in dealing with the limits of our water resources. Um, you're close to the Little Continental Divide at this location. Uh, you also are close to the headwaters of a number of rivers, uh, Yellow River, Little Mulberry, uh, help me out, Alcove, App Appalachie, uh, and, and those uh, flow obviously flow into other larger rivers and, and head on down to the coast. Uh, the deal about the Little Continental Divide, if it falls on one side of that Little Continental Divide, it goes to the, the Gulf of Mexico. If it falls on the other side, it goes to the Atlantic Ocean. You might say, why put the, not only this facility, but the, the, what's on the rest of the Sock County site here, uh, our largest treatment facility here? Well, it makes no, lot, no sense from an engineering standpoint, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Uh, and my son is a civil engineer who works for the City of Gainesville Utilities Department, so I have 
lots of lectures about why this plant makes no sense uh, over the course of time for my son. The fact of the matter is we do what we have to do. You heard Chairman Hill, Wayne Hill's name mentioned. He had just come into office. There was a uh, proposal to permit another treatment facility on the Yellow River uh, down close to the south end of Gwinnett County. And there was a battle royal going on about that. Uh, he and a newly elected district commissioner walked into, his, as they describe it, a buzzsaw of a public meeting. Uh, folks may, recognize, may want their water to come, uh, clean water to come out of the faucet, and they may want their dirty water to go away when they flush, but they really don't want that happening close to them. Some of you who are in elected office may have experienced the resistance that comes from that. Wayne is, is a pilot of a small plane, had his own small plane, so he got up in the air and looked for a place that was, was insulated from any residential property. So there you have it. It makes no sense from an engineering standpoint. It, uh, uh, we, we paid lots of money for uh, uh, cost of transporting uh, wastewater to the facility here. But ironically, it got us a whole lot closer with that treatment to where we're sending treated wastewater now. Highly treated wastewater intended for reuse, right? Is, am I saying it right, Ron? Uh, and, and that's Lake Lanier. Uh, so we're doing our part to tr return um, a good deal of our treated wastewater to Lake Lanier, which is where all of our water comes from. Uh, and um, no, we know that that type of, of action is, has to be part of our plan going forward. Um, our purpose today is really not to you know, debate the, the ins and outs of the w continuing saga of the water wars necessarily, though I'm, that has to be part of the discussion. Uh, uh, we're not interested in trying to second guess the state strategy or anything like that. Uh, there's, there's lots going on that is not necessarily being, uh, not necessarily in, in the public purview at this point, but uh, it, it's still timely, very timely for us to talk about the um, aspects of water resources in uh, North Georgia in particular, and what, what the future, get, begin to get a sense of what the future looks like for all of us and our children and grandchildren as we deal with how do we make the most of our water resources, how are we, how are we responsible, and how do we figure out how to share it. Uh, that's not what they told me to say, <laughs> but I think I captured the sense of what we're, we're looking for out of this day. And I want to say to all the folks that are serving on panels, to, to um, Boyd Austin, who's here as, as chairman of the North Georgia Metropolitan Water Planning District. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days to come be with us and share with these folks and, and, and be willing to um, help the conversation that needs to be had, uh, that we need to have about the issue of water. Boy, it took him two hours to get across. Shouldn't take that long without traffic, but it, it sure does during the time of the day you're having to travel. So thank you for your sacrifice. Steve? Appreciate that. Uh, Charlotte gave up her morning. She's got a series of budget meetings this morning, so let's give her a hand for that. As, uh, as Chairman Nash said, this is, uh, this is your, your day. This is your meeting. Um, there are three of these symposiums across the metropolitan Atlanta area. Uh, the next one is September the 13th, which is the Northeast section, which is Cobb, Cherokee, and Douglas, and Paulding. There is one on the October the 18th, and it's the southern side of the metropolitan area with Clayton, Henry, and Coweta, and Fayette. And then you've got one on October the 24th, uh, which is Fulton, DeKalb, and uh, City of Atlanta. And uh, if you want to know more about where they, those are located, just see me after the meeting. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, let you know where they are. But uh, tomorrow, uh, Friday, just so you know, uh, Jack Dozier is on the panel. Uh, and it will be held at his shop at the Georgia Association of Water Professionals, which is located at 1655 Enterprise Way in Marietta. So all of the folks that came from Cobb County today, we get to share the love going back to Jack's place on Friday. 
Um, today you'll hear uh, from a, a lot of policy experts. Uh, sorry, I have to do my glasses up on and off. And it's, uh, it's your day to ask a lot of questions. These folks are here to, uh, as Charlotte said, not to debate uh, whether it's right or wrong, but more to encourage you to ask questions, even those questions that you were afraid to ask. Um, for those of you who uh, will look on your table, you'll see a three by five card. Uh, if you're one of those folks that just really doesn't want to stand up and ask a question, um, every organization has a lovely assistant. Uh, Terry, Terry Lawler, if you'll raise your hand. Terry is our lovely assistant, and uh, he will be bringing a mic around to each table as he sees hands raised. Uh, but for those people who want to write down a question while you're thinking about it as you hear information today, uh, Terry will be happy to come around and take up that three by five card. Um, without, uh, as you know, we've got some sponsorships up here and uh, we couldn't do this without our sponsors. So let me get, uh, you'll see the Gwinnett Environmental Heritage Center uh, Foundation. You'll see the Re Regional Business Coalition uh, of Metro Atlanta. That's Terry's organization. Those are platinum. Uh, the University of Georgia School of Environmental Design, uh, AT&T, Noonan Utilities, uh, the Georgia Association of Water Professionals, the Georgia EMCs, the Patillo Industrial Real Estate, um, Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District, uh, at Brownlee's Furniture, you'll see our nice chairs today, and uh, the Henry County Chamber of Commerce, those are our sponsors today. And just to kind of help as an icebreaker so we can kind of get to know everybody, um, we would like to introduce our elected officials. Uh, this is uh, set up for the elected officials uh, to help you understand a little more about what water policy is and what might be on the radar out there for you. So uh, what I'd like to do is start with this table over here by Jack. Jack, if you will raise your hand just so we know where to start. Uh, we're going to go around to each table, and if you will uh, introduce yourself and where you're from, that would be great. Jack, kick us off. Tell you what, let me, let me, I've got to get my lovely assistant going here. <laughs> there he comes. Martin Wattenbarger, I'm with Rob Woodall's office. Good morning, I'm Mark Reese. Also serve on the Natural Resources and Environment Committee at the state. I'm Todd Edwards with the Association of County Commissioners, and I handle environmental policy uh, for that organization. Thank you, Valerie Clark, representative from Gwinnett in the Lawrenceville Collins Hill area. Joyce Chandler, representative from District 105, which is in Gwinnett. Parts of Grayson, parts of Lawrenceville, and the uh, Gwinnett part of Loganville. Good morning. I'm Scott Haggard. I'm Government Affairs Manager for the Atlanta Regional Commission. Uh, Chase Brooks, Gwinnett County Commissioner. I'm Renee Enterman, Senator, Senate District 45, and you're in Buford, and I'd like to welcome you here to the Gwinnett County and Buford, and I represent Buford, Sugar Hill, Swanee, all the way up to Brazelton, and every other part of Northern Gwinnett County here. I'm Boyd Austin, I'm mayor of the city of Dallas, and I also chair the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District. Joel Peacock, director of operations for the Georgia Association of Water Professionals. I'm Pam Burnett. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Georgia Association of Water Professionals. I'm Eddie Williams. I'm the uh, past chair of uh, American Council of Engineering Consultants of Georgia and also CEO of Keck and Wood Engineering Firm. 
I'm Pete Frost, and I'm the Executive Director for the Douglasville, Douglas County Water and Sewer Authority. Shannon Volkadov, Gwinnett County Sheriff's Office. Phil Hoskins, I'm Director of Community Services here in Gwinnett County. Chris Baller, Gwinnett County Probate Judge. I'm Jimmy Burnett, Mayor of Swanee. Hey, Buzz Brockway, a state representative from uh, Lawrenceville and Swanee, and about half a mile that way is my district, so we're close. Uh, Bucky Johnson, Mayor of Norcross. <laughs> I'm Christina Bloom. I'm the Chief Magistrate Judge for Gwinnett County. Richard Steele, I'm Gwinnett County Tax Commissioner. I'm Danny Johnson, Manager of the North Georgia Metropolitan Water Planning District. Anoop Shah, VP of Environmental Affairs with Metro Atlanta Chamber. I'm Ken Reardon, I'm the Hall County Public Works and Utilities Director. Steve North with the City of Lawrenceville. Bob Baroni, City of Lawrenceville. I'm Bob Clark, I'm City Councilman in Lawrenceville. Thank you all for uh, all of that. And again, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule this morning to be with us. Um, again, we are excited that you're here. We hope you ask a lot of uh, in-depth questions because these guys have been studying this topic their entire life almost. So um, it is my honor to introduce uh, Mayor Boyd Austin. Uh, Mayor Austin is gonna kick us off this morning with a, a regional perspective. As you've heard, uh, uh, Mayor Austin is the chairman of the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District. Uh, he too is a Georgia graduate and uh, has been mayor since 1996. That's incredible, thank you. Um, Boyd and his family are lifelong residents of Paulding County and without further ado, let me uh, welcome Mayor Austin. It really makes a statement about Gwinnett's um, commitment to the environment the foresight of former Chairman Hill and the leadership of Chairman Nash. To my fellow elected officials, those city officials, my fellow mayors, that we, uh, we are together quite often at GMA events, the city council members and the commissioners, particularly the state representatives and Senator Underman. Thank you for taking time out of your day to be here. I first got involved in water in 2001 when Speaker Murphy appointed me to the first statewide water study committee. We did a lot of good work, had a lot of good things that came out of it, but we had a terrible thing that happened. It rained. And everybody took their eyes off the ball and we had to get into another drought before we started taking water issues seriously again. We had another rain event and then finally we got the uh, water councils passed and got those in place and hopefully they will become a permanent fixture like the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District has become. In just a little over a decade, we have become one of the nation's leaders in conservation. Uh, we have a great story to tell. In that time period when the population of the 15 county region grew by more than a million people, we cut per capita water use by 20 percent. That's a phenomenal success story. We're doing things that our neighbors aren't doing, have refused to do. I want you to, there's a uh, little flyer, it may be turned up, says RBC, Water Education Symposium on there. It gives you a few uh, facts at the top, but I want you to particularly flip it over and look at the map on the back side. That map shows the boundaries of the 15 county region. It encompasses 92 cities. Is it 59 water providers? Somewhere in that nature. Uh, it sits across six river basins and more than five million people call this district home. We talk about an environmental policy dealing with water, but for every one of us who is an elected official, every business owner, every resident, it's an economic issue as well. And to me, the motivation with our neighbors is more economic than it is environmental. That nothing I say is written, so you can't blame the district. <laughs> Catherine and Daniel will probably be on pins and needles. But you know, we look at this and we see just how complex this region is, but then we look at our state as a whole. 
that encompasses 14 river basins, 159 counties, 530 cities, 180 or 81 school districts, who knows how many hundred water providers. We have to look at a plan, as we've done in the district, to look at a regional plan. We need to now look at the state in an integrated plan that we understand it's Georgia. It's not just Atlanta or the Atlanta region. Uh, I say a lot of times when people talk about the Metropolitan Water District, I am Atlanta. I'm on the far western edge. But so much of the angst against us is directed at the city of Atlanta, the corporate limits. But we are all Atlanta when they're talking about us in Florida and in Alabama. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we had uh, a couple of uh, uh, op-ed articles that appeared in papers. One of them said Atlanta uses all the water, takes all the water, and the poor people in Florida, and the, particularly the oysters, have no water. Well, last week I sent a copy of an article, I think, that appeared in the Gwinnett paper that said Atlanta's releasing too much water. It's raining too much, and it's washing us away. They ought to build reservoirs to hold it. It is not a unified message, and that's what tells me it's not based just on water. It's about the economic impact that it has. One other thing, Catherine and I have been talking about it, is the um, one of the major points they make in Florida about the water use is the oyster industry. It's a six million dollar industry. If you take the normal multiplier of five, you get 30 million dollars, and in the gross domestic of product of Florida, it's much less than 1% of their gross domestic product. What we need to do in Georgia is look at the, the industries that are affected here, particularly our agribusiness. And a lot of people in our region may say, what do we have to do with agribusiness? Look north and west at the poultry industry, a huge portion of our agribusiness. If we took all the counties that lay in those two basins, the ACF and the ACT basins, I think you would find that it is probably in the teens to the 20 percentile of Georgia's gross domestic product that's at stake. And we have to look at every issue. We have to battle every point. And under my leadership, I have asked the staff, with the concurrence of the attorneys that read everything we send out, to be more proactive and to make sure that our arguments are heard based on facts rather than using just the emotional issues that some of our neighboring states have, have done. So with that, I would encourage you to attend, to be invested in the water district's activities. I appreciate all of you that attend every year. We have a legislative reception at the Capitol, and try, at the Capitol during the session to try to make sure that our message is out, that you relay that to your counterparts and that you help us to educate them about the, the issues that are most important. Uh, Interbasin transfers is an ugly word to a lot of people, but 102 of Georgia's 159 counties right now is doing an interbasin transfer within their county. It's nothing new, and there's a lot of safeguards that have been put in the law since then, but it's one of those political bombs that people can throw, and it has a great effect on all of us, particularly this region. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the opportunity uh, for our panel to speak, to get to know some of the issues, and we can provide any amount of information you need or want, and we're willing to come to any organization. If it's Rotary or a school symposium or whatever, we're willing to be there. And I appreciate Terry Lawler and the RBC for arranging these four meetings so that people have that opportunity close by to be in and to hear from the experts and know the issue that we're dealing with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Austin. Uh, we're going to have a little uh, little change in uh, um, room set up here as our panelists uh, come up. So I'm going to ask our panelists to come on up to the stage here. Uh, while they're doing that, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about housekeeping. Um, sometime around uh, four o'clock today we'll have lunch um, so uh, but a little little uh, just after our panelists wind up right around 11:45, uh, 
we'll start to break for lunch. Lunch is going to uh, be in the dining hall here, and then we'll come back in here to eat. Um, uh, so we wanted to kind of uh, let you know about that. And then um, uh, there's coffee uh, and snacks in the back throughout the morning here and water. Uh, how, how about that? We have water at a water uh, symposium. Um, and then um, we will we'll carry on throughout our day. Um, as uh, Mayor Austin said, water is uh, very important to the region, it's very important to the state, and it's very important about how we uh, know and learn about that. Let me, Lisa, you want to close the lights? Um, yeah. Uh, One of our partnerships, as you heard, is with the University of Georgia, uh, with the School of Environmental Design. Um, we thought about letting them do little puppet figures, but we decided not to do that. Um, there is a, a lot of effort that went into this early on. Um, with Chairman Nash, and one of those efforts was just to establish partnerships, and two of those key partnerships were with the University of Georgia and the Gwinnett uh, Public School System. Uh, it's just so um, fortunate that she laid the groundwork for that because now we have a great working relationship with the School of Environmental Design, and today we're uh, blessed to have uh, its dean here, uh, Dean Dan Nanita. Nadina Cech. Um, he is also um, holds the Draper Chair of Landscape Architecture. Prior to coming to UGA, he served as the Community Revitalization Director for Restoration Institute at Clemson University. That y'all may have heard about Clemson. <laughs> as you can imagine, Dan is an author and remains a teaching professor, um, a researcher, and a scholar, particularly in cultural landscape. Dan serves on the Board of Trustees of the Gwinnett Environmental and Heritage Center and is very active on the campus here. Uh, he brings his students here every year and uh, we have a great time educating the, uh, uh, his folks. Dan currently serves on the Georgia National Register Review Board and has uh, bestowed the Council of Education and Landscape Architecture Outstanding Administrator of the Ward, uh, Award, Year Award. He remains very active in his professional societies, uh, the American uh, Society of Landscape Architects, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, American Planning Association, and the Council of Educators of Landscape Architecture. Uh, Dan practices what he preached. He and his wife, Jeannie, bought a, a home in uh, one of uh, Athens' uh, restorative downtown neighborhoods. Um, he has two sons and three grandchildren and um, is just enjoys being here with us and uh, has been a great uh, mentor to me. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Dan Nadinacek. Sorry about that, Dan. Uh, I wanted to start uh, before introducing the, the panel with a question. How many of you have had a chance to travel to uh, Rome and have visited Trevi Fountain? So what is Trevi Fountain? That's the question. What is it? Come on, I'm a teacher. I'm going to get this going here. What's Trevi Fountain? Now that's true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the, the key. Everybody thinks about it as this place where you throw coins so you can come back to Rome and all of that. If you think back to other cultures and societies, um, the point then was to celebrate water, to make it visible. And that's one of the things that I think is so important about this building uh, is that once again, in a culture where for so many years we've run water underground, we've hid it from view, we're bringing it out in the open, we're studying it, we're bringing school children here uh, to, to 
uh, be able to discuss and, and talk about what, what's happening. So um, it's for that reason uh, that I think design and planning is so important, and, and uh, that's why I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we uh, have a, a master's degree in environmental planning. We have uh, a couple of degrees in landscape architecture. Uh, we, uh, in fact, uh, do the uh, certificate for the entire university in environmental ethics. And all of these issues, if you look at what's at the heart of them, it comes back to water. Uh, I, however, will not claim to be an expert on uh, these issues. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, in fact, uh, you know, I'm more of a historian, landscape historian, than I am a uh, water expert. So that's why we have this great panel uh, here before you. And I also want to mention uh, that there are many people at the University of Georgia who know a whole lot more about this than I do. Mark Greasy is one of those uh, people. And the next session is actually going to be moderated by uh, Dr. John Calabria of, uh, of our faculty, who is also a, w a water expert. So uh, uh, tomorrow, I'm getting on an airplane uh, to fly to Istanbul. And uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, the, the first thing that might come to your mind is that, boy, uh, you know, administrators at UGA aren't too bright to get on a plane on 9-11 to fly somewhere in the general direction of Syria, which is what uh, I'm going to do. But in reflecting about that trip, uh, it, it reminded me that when you're in Istanbul, uh, in most parts of the city, they tell you not to drink water out of the tap. Uh, that's almost not an issue anywhere in the United States. And so we have a whole lot to be happy about and thankful for in terms of how water is handled in the United States, but we also have a number of problems and issues to deal with, which I thought were covered very well by uh, Mayor Austin and by Chairperson Nash. So hopefully we can get at a few of those uh, issues as we move through our discussion. And then, once again, before I uh, introduce the panel and ask them to say a few things, I want to give you first an overview of what we're going to do all together. And that is, um, once we have the panelists introduce themselves uh, in a little more detail than I will, I'm going to pose a few questions for them to get the ball rolling. But what we really want is for all of you to be part of this process so that this is a true panel discussion and uh, all of you begin to ask questions. So the way to do that is that uh, if you uh, raise your hand, uh, there will be a microphone delivered to you, and uh, you'll be able to make sure that you're recorded as a part of this uh, entire session as you ask your uh, brilliant and scintillating question to, uh, to the panel. So let me, um, from uh, uh, your, uh, let's see, your left to right, uh, start uh, with, uh, Catherine Zitch, uh, director of the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District. Uh, Jack, uh, well, no, we're, we're out of order here. Uh, Russ Pennington, um, who is uh, director of the Georgia Association of Water Professionals. Uh, Jack Dozier, uh, director of the uh, Georgia Association of Water, Prof water Professionals. I guess I, uh, Pennington, uh, sorry. I'm getting uh, messed up because I didn't have the order right. Uh, Russ is uh, Director of Policy and External Affairs for Georgia's Environmental Protection Division, DNR. Forgive me. Um, and um, uh, then uh, Tim Perkins. Uh, Tim is Director of the Forsyth uh, County Water and Sewer Department. Uh, Ron Peters, uh, who is uh, Gwinnett County's Department of Water Resources, Director of Legislation, Environmental and Community Relations. And finally, uh, Don Dye. Assistant Public Utilities Director with the City of Gainesville. Um, so now that I messed that up, let me have them tell you uh, who they are and, and give you a little bit more information. Thank you, Dan. Everybody can hear me, I hope. Though with the Clemson comment, maybe you don't want to hear me. Um, my name is Catherine Zitch. I am the Director of the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District. Uh, we are blessed to have such an engaged chairman and Mayor Boyd Austin and uh, the, the Metropolitan North Georgia Water Planning District, which I will, for the rest of this morning, just call the Metro Water District or something along those lines. 
is responsible for the planning water, wastewater, storm water for the 15 counties across the region. We're also responsible for working with the local utilities in implementing conservation measures that uh, the water utilities are required to implement. And that's been really important when we talk about moving forward with negotiations and discussions and lawsuits with Florida and Alabama, because we can talk about the great stewardship that your community and your utility providers are leading us towards. And we really have some great numbers, some of them are on that handout, to share that help us when we're talking about being good water stewards. The Metro Water District is staffed by members of the Atlanta Regional Commission, so my employer is the Atlanta Regional Commission. I am also the Natural Resources Division Manager. Atlanta Regional Commission and, uh, and the Natural Resources Division is involved intimately with some of the uh, water wars related issues. So we have been involved over the years with both the litigation side providing legal support and technical support. We have a suite of uh, technical experts that have helped in that litigation through the years, uh, as well as now working with the U.S. Congress on some of the uh, attacks on the use of our lakes that's going through the U.S. Congress with the uh, Water Resources and Reform Development Act. So we're working both locally planning and also making sure that we are protecting Georgia's water resources for our use. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Russ Pennington. I am Director of Policy and Public Affairs for the Georgia Environmental Protection Division, which is a division of the De Georgia Department of Natural Resources. So we are tasked with not only being the state regulator, but protecting the state's environment as well as the natural resources. Uh, EPD has three branches, air, land, and water. And uh, my background has been historically in water. I'm relatively new to EPD. So um, it, it's kind of my passion to be involved in this topic. And we've had some turnover, or I should say some, some changing chairs within management at EPD, and I found myself getting to enjoy my passion in the water industry uh, and working with Catherine and others and Jack as well as uh, others in the room. We've got many great partners. We've got many great things to accomplish uh, and like we should be able to focus on protecting purely our natural resources and the environment and water of the state of Georgia. We find ourselves going to Washington DC and testifying in front of the Senate and Congress and countering balances between Florida and Alabama and also Tennessee and South Carolina. And uh, I think it all goes to show how passionate people get when it comes to water. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. I'm Jack Dozier. I'm the executive director of Georgia Association of Water Professionals. And in fairness to Dan, Russ just mentioned to me that he switched these chairs. Uh, so, <laughs> so speaking of switching chairs, I guess he does <laughs> Uh, we're an association of some 4,000 water professionals in the state of Georgia, and I'm not talking about water skiers or, or uh, swimmers. Our water professionals are people that deliver safe drinking water to your town, people that, that are responsible for protecting the waters in our streams. Um, just by a show of hands, how many people in the room are members of GAWP? There are a good number of folks here who, who are water professionals, um, and, and th these folks day in and day out are responsible for, uh, for making sure that, that our water is safe. Um, and and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in just a couple of minutes about the history of how we got to where we are. Um, but, uh, but by way of background, I'm a, a graduate of Duke University. Uh, we're 2-0 and o for the first time in 15 years. <laughs> and of course, our quarterback broke his collarbone this, this last weekend. So. Um, but uh, I've got a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's in environmental engineering from Duke. I've been the executive director of GAWP since 1990. Uh, prior to that, I worked for 15 years with the Environmental Protection Division. Um, so so I, I've, uh, when we get into the history of water, um, I guess I was here uh, when, when, uh, uh, when Oglethorpe came in. Um, uh, but uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of water in just a second. My name's Tim Perkins. I am the Director of Water and Sewer in Forsyth County. I'm a 25-year employee. I've been the Director since uh, for 18 years, going on 18. Uh, uh, during that time, you know, Forsyth County started growing at a massive rate in the, in the late 80s. When I became Director in 1996, I believe we had a little less than 10,000 water counts 
Uh, in this short period of time, we've, we're now approaching 50,000 water accounts. We've had massive growth uh, during that time. We had no facilities when I started. We started planning a uh, wastewater plant right before I became director. <clears throat> I spoke recently to a, a group, a uh, civic group, and right after I started in 96, I went to them and told them we're almost, we're about ready to start building this wastewater plant. Well, I met with them last year and I told them the same thing. We're almost ready to build this wastewater plant. It's been a, a long effort, uh, a lot longer than it should have been. But uh, during that time, I've been able to see a lot of, uh, work on a lot of committees, the Upper Chattahoochee Basin Group that studied Lake Lanier several years ago to work on the return flow that Gwinnett's uh, doing to the lake and made sure that was done in a safe manner. I've served on the uh, Etowah River Alliance and some 319 grant projects with some groups there. And, Currently, I also sit on the uh, ACFS Stakeholders Board. That's the uh, stakeholders that are trying to come to some common ground on sharing the water supply with uh, Alabama and Florida. And there are several people here and, and on the panel that are heavily involved in, in that group also. Uh, but uh, that's a little background on my, my history. Thanks, Tim. I'm Ron Peters. Uh, I'm the deputy director with Gwinnett County Department of Water Resources, and I've been with the department for 30 years. Uh, prior to that, I spent 10 years with the City of Atlanta Water Department, so I've been around, know a little bit about water. Uh, Gwinnett County, you've been drinking, those of you who've got a glass of water, those of you with the bottles, you're on your own, but those are the glass. Uh, Y'all have been drinking Gwinnett County water. We're very proud of the quality of the water that we produce in Gwinnett County. We are one of the leaders in uh, the water industry in the state of Georgia. And uh, this plant that's just right down the street from this facility here is a world-class plant. Uh, uh, we have people come from around the world just to visit that plant. Uh, it has uh, a near pristine uh, discharge uh, from the treated wastewater. Uh, we call it highly treated wastewater in the sense that we have the highest and tightest treatment limits in the state of Georgia. And um, we're actually real quite proud that uh, even though it was a long fight to get to that point uh, with this plan as well, uh, we're quite proud of the fact that we're able to treat water to that level and return it to its source in Lake Lanier. Um, as a way of background, I'm a Mercer University graduate. Go Bears, I can finally <laughs> say that. Um, and uh, I grew up, so I was literally born into this business because I grew up on the uh, site of a City of Atlanta water treatment plant uh, right at the confluence of Chattahoochee River and Peachtree Creek. So I've been around water, it's in my blood, it's all I know. I'm Don Dye, I'm the Assistant Public Utilities Director for City of Gainesville. I don't have the history these guys have. Uh, I've been there two years next month. Prior to that, I was in the Savannah River Basin with the City of Toccoa, uh, Stevens County, for about 12 and a half years as Water Director and Utilities Director. Uh, Gainesville has two water plants, two wastewater plants. We actually return more to Lake Lanier than we uh, half, more than half of what we take out of Lake Lanier, and actually at a, le at a less amount than was originally agreed to by the allocation by the Corps back in 1957. And uh, Gainesville's very proud of that, and I'm very pleased to be here. So I, I think all of you can see that virtually any question that you might have is going to be uh, somehow addressed by at least one, if not uh, a number, of the people on this panel. Before we begin with the questions, I also want to say that uh, I'm very, very pleased that so many elected officials are here. Uh, you all have uh, the toughest job in the history of this nation right now because we're facing so many changes. Things are happening so rapidly, and you're always caught in the middle between taking care of the sort of day-to-day -day needs of your constituents, but also hopefully thinking down the road, providing that future vision uh, that, that makes the place that you live in and work in a better place for future generations. It's, it's an extremely difficult job, and hopefully it's then bringing those two goals, that goal of uh, your future visioning and what the knowledge of this panel holds that will 
take us to a, a greater uh, step in understanding what needs to happen with water. I want to uh, start by posing uh, a couple of questions before we open it up. And before I do that, uh, I, I actually want to read just a short paragraph that sets up the first question that I'm going to ask Jack Dozier. Um, now, many of you may think that uh, the laws are really clear when they're written, but it's not always the case. And let me read this paragraph. All waters with a significant nexus to navigable waters are covered under the Clean Water Act. However, the phrase significant nexus remains open to judicial interpretation and considerable controversy. The 1972 statute frequently uses the term navigable waters, but also defines the term waters of the United States, including territorial seas. Some re regulations interpreting the 1972 law, for example, have included water features such as intermittent streams, playa lakes, prairie potholes, sloughs, and wetlands as waters of the United States. So with that as just uh, a paragraph or tantalizing uh, background, uh, I would like to ask Jack, uh, can you provide a summary of how the creation and passage of the 1972 Clean Water Act uh, has an impact on 21st century water uh, management and municipality management? I would love to do that. Um, I'm going to um, ask you to travel back with me in time about 40 years. Um, 42 years ago, the Clean Water Act was passed. We just come out of the 1960s, a, a, a time of turmoil. Um, activism was at a new high. Social unrest was um, was the, the the word of the day, I guess. We had we had three major assassinations during the 60s. Um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring kind of kicked off the, the idea of environmentalism. Um, we had massive fish kills all over the country. We had the Cuyahoga River was on fire for crying out loud. Um, in 1969, we passed the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, 1970, the first major uh, environmental legislation, the Clean Water Act, was passed. The Clean Air Act was passed, and and we had Earth Day. And and that was uh, I was a sophomore in, in uh, college at the time, and that was the first time I really became aware. I was in civil engineering, thinking, what in the heck am I going to do with this for for a career? And all of a sudden, environmentalism became the the, the, uh, the word of the day, and and uh, I was introduced to environmental. Uh, engineering at that point in time, and uh, thank goodness, because otherwise I'd probably end up being an, an attorney. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but there was a new, new awareness of the environment. And uh, Senator Muskie had been working for years on, on, the, on a, a Clean Water Act revision uh, to, to what were very ineffective laws at the time. But this gave him the impetus he needed to get the, the, the Clean Water Act passed in 1972. And what that act did was it established um, national philosophy of, of uh, we're, we're going to meet fishable, swimmable standards by 1985. Um, prior to 1972, most of the states had, had, uh, had uh, state water acts in, in place. We did in Georgia. We had started in 1964 with the passage of the Georgia Water Quality Control Act. Um, and at that time, and in fact at the time that the uh, Clean Water Act was passed, in 1972, we had about 200 discharges in the state of Georgia that were meeting less than uh, secondary treatment, about 100 raw discharges, <coughs> discharges straight into the, into the streams and rivers. And in fact, uh, I read a 1953 report uh, when they were, when they were, just when they were getting ready to, to build Lake Lanier uh, for the city of Gainesville, an engineering report that said, holy cow, if they dam up the lake, dam up the river and turn it into a lake, we're going to have to start treating our wastewater. Um, Georgia had a, uh, had a pretty aggressive program from 1964 to 1972 uh, that was, was headed up by Rock Howard, who's one of my heroes. Uh, he was still at the EPD when I started there in 1975. Um, but the EPD, had, had, or the Water Quality Control Board under Rock Howard, had made significant progress. By 1972, they had most of the, industry, the industries in line with some level of, of best practical treatment. Uh, we had 375 discharges from industry in 1965 that weren't meeting any, any level of standards um, that had been brought into compliance by 1972. So, so they were very effective with those. The municipal side was a lot harder to do anything with. Um, 
there was precious little money, but the, but the 1972 Act brought in, in with it a huge federal construction grants program. Uh, it provided 75% federal funding for, for wastewater facilities to meet the new standards, and, and the standards were designed um, to, to, um, uh, to, to, to protect streams to get us to fishable, swimmable quality. Um, the national goal, the, the defined national goal was to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. That meant fishable, swimmable by 1985, and then they, they used the term navigable waters, waters of the United States. Nobody really knew what all that meant, but what, what it boiled down to is if you can put a toy boat in it and float it, it, it needs to meet water quality standards. Um, in Georgia, I spent 15 years um, of my career promoting land application, no discharge systems. Now the new state water plan says the preferred choice for, for treating, for handling treated wastewater is return to surface streams. Well, times have changed. In 1972 through 1990, we didn't have the treatment levels, we didn't have a treatment technology that could do what this facility could do, um, the, the F. Wayne Hill plant. Um, we, we used land application wherever we could to get discharges out of the streams, and I will tell you that I will defend that decision uh, to my dying day. It was the right thing to do at the right time, um, but times have changed. We've got technology today that can do a whole lot more than that. Uh, the, the, um, the Federal Act in 1972 created a, a huge permitting program, and that, that's kind of the backbone for our efforts to get water quality uh, control um, in place, but it focuses on point source discharges. When the act was passed in 1972 and, and for the 10 years after that, Georgia focused virtually all of its efforts on point source discharges. That, that was getting, we already had the industries pretty well in, in hand, but it was getting all those wastewater treatment facilities from municipalities up to speed at either secondary treatment or higher levels to meet advanced waste treatment levels if needed to meet water quality standards in the stream. Um, and and um, in 1982, we did an assessment of, of state's water quality uh, as a part of a national assessment. And Georgia said in 1982, we don't have any non-point source problems. Even with all the progress we made, we said, we don't have any non-point source problems. Our problems are all point source problems. Well, once we got the point source problems taken, uh, taken care of, we discovered, yes, we did have non-point source problems. Um, but we had made tremendous progress. We, we got all the facilities in place, and there was virtually billions of dollars spent on wastewater, wastewater upgrades uh, in the state of Georgia. Um, we led a charge, Georgia led a charge to convert the construction grants program at the national level from grants to loans and created a state revolving loan program that's currently operated by GFA. Um, but that was, it was a state's initiative, Georgia being in the lead, but, but the states all combined and, and our local governments supported Georgia in doing that because we all realized that sustainability was going to be important and we couldn't keep relying on federal grants forever. It just wasn't gonna happen. So we wanted to create a sustainable source of, of uh, funding for, uh, for keeping our facilities in place uh, and, and up to speed. Um, that, that is, uh, has been a noble effort. We still have sustainability problems from a funding standpoint because remember we had 75% federal funding for those initial facilities and now we've got, we're, we're relying strictly on loans. So it becomes harder and harder and we're gonna talk a little bit, I'm sure later about infrastructure financing. Um, but, um, but today the problems that we've got le left are, are um, virtually all non-point source related, uh, very difficult to deal with. It's not like treating something that everything comes down the pipe and you, you can put a treatment facility. Uh, the, the fish advisories that we've got in Georgia are for things like chlordane, dioxin, PCBs, um, things that were uh, DDT, things that were banned 20, 30, 40 years ago from use. Um, the PCBs, uh, are, are in, in, in fish tissue. Um, PCBs haven't been manufactured, haven't been used in manufacturing for about 30 years in Georgia. 
the thing that made them the most attractive was that they wouldn't break down. Well, now that's the thing that makes them the least attractive. Um, so we continue to see problems from things like that. And, and as we move forward with the Clean Water Act, we see progressions of, of uh, and maybe with, with diminishing returns, but, but we still are dealing with things that, that need to be dealt with. We've, got, uh, we've gone from, um, from point source discharges to now we're dealing with, with uh, protecting wetlands, anti-degradation, uh, sustainable watershed management, um, balancing federal and state enforcement. Uh, APD is under tremendous pressure to, to enforce the law with, with what seems to be diminishing uh, resources um, and EPA threatening to take programs away from them when EPA doesn't have the resources to do it either, which is, uh, is fascinating to me. Um, so, so one of our big challenges is to, is to keep moving forward with the, the, the resources um, to make sure that we've got the resources that we need to protect our water quality. Um, but I, I will, will, will kind of point out this that, that I think um, uh, Dan mentioned in his opening remarks is if you go anywhere around the world, you're, you're, you're at risk when you drink the water. Um, right now, 1.1 billion people, one-sixth of the world's population, don't have access to safe drinking water. Uh, 2.6 billion people, uh, about 40% of the world's population, don't have access to safe sanitation. During the course of the last 10 minutes that I've been talking, 40 children have died because of, of waterborne disease of some sort. Women and children in these developing countries spend their entire waking hours hauling water back and forth. Um, and, uh, and as a result, they can never break that, po that, that poverty cycle. They're, they're, they never have an opportunity to get an education. All they do is haul water. Um, in this country, I would, I would venture to say that your safe drinking water contributes as much to the quality of life that we enjoy as anything that you, that you uh, any tangible thing that you can put your hands on. Um, when you go to the tap, you don't have to worry about whether the water is safe. Um, when you flush the toilet, you don't have to worry about where, where it's gonna go. You know it's gonna be taken care of. And let your water be cut off for, for a couple of hours on a Saturday morning, you'll realize how important it is. Um, so I guess the end of my message would be, uh, when you go home today, um, Remember your water professionals. They're the people that help make your quality of life what it is. Uh, before you leave this room today, hug a water professional. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions as we move forward, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, we will be hosting the, the meeting when, uh, Friday this week in Northwest uh, Metro Atlanta, and we also have a lead gold certified building, so, so we invite you to come back to, to, to join us next week. Thank you, Jack. So in uh, Mayor Austin's comments and in other discussion, the, uh, the, uh, the, the problems and possibilities of uh, interbasin transfer was discussed. I really think we should uh, spend a little time with that. Uh, the, the question basically is, interbasin transfer legislation seems to be of interest during almost every legislative session um, any of you, this is, uh, and maybe you want to start, Jack, but the rest of you uh, chime in. Uh, please elaborate on the, the complexities of, of yeah, interbasin transfer. I'll start transfer. this and then we're going to pass it off. Um, interbasin transfer, I, I, I hate to be a poster child for interbasin transfer, um, but let me tell you this it is not a bad word, it's not, uh, um, it's not something that is a necessary evil. Interbasin transfer is, is a part of our life. Uh, Mayor Austin mentioned 102 counties, I think, out of our 159 have some sort of interbasin transfer. Uh, um, you cannot have regional solutions without moving water from, from one place to another. Uh, you can't put a population of, of uh, you mentioned one million people uh, way back when, five million people today in Metro Atlanta. Uh, and, and understand that we do sit on a major subcontinental ridge. Uh, Chairman Nash said, uh, said we sit on, on a subcontinental ridge. Atlanta, you couldn't pick a worse place to put the city of Atlanta if you wanted to look from a water perspective. 
Atlanta's not here for, for water reasons, it's here because of transportation reasons. And it's a little too, the horse is already out of the barn. It's a little bit too late for us to think about moving Atlanta to Hawkinsville, uh, where, where the water is. Um, but uh, I, because we sit on a ridge, there, and, and we've got a relatively minor stream, the Chattahoochee River, uh, that we rely very heavily on, we do have to engineer the waters uh, to an extent. We, when we look at donor basin transfers, we have to be very careful that we don't penalize the donor basin at the, and to, to benefit uh, a receptor basin. But we, we have to use interbasin transfer as one of the tools in order to be able to, to meet our needs. And like I said, Atlanta couldn't possibly exist here without interbasin transfer. Just to give you an example of how much, if you, if you ever have any regional solutions at all that, that we rely on interbasin transfer, if you were to go to dinner at Mary Max tonight and drink three or four glasses of iced tea um, and then go across the street to the Fox for a play, you're probably going to participate in a major interbasin transfer in the first <laughs> evening, um, to, just to get the point across. So Atlanta does a whole lot of things uh, to, to counteract the fact that we're in a, in a bad place uh, from a geographic standpoint. And I'll let anybody else that wants to jump in. Um, and and I, I think I'm gonna move, kick it over to Catherine to, to uh, tell a little bit about what Atlanta does do. Thanks, Jack. Uh, as Jack and, and Chairman Nash have talked about, we are sitting on a ridge line. And so some of the water, the water that flows out of Lake Lanier that is a primary source of drinking water for Metro Atlanta would flow to Apalachicola Bay. And it does when we return our highly treated effluent to Lake Lanier and the Chattahoochee River. Water that flows to the east portion of uh, the metro region flows down to the Atlantic. And many of our Georgia cities benefit from the highly treated effluent that we uh, discharge into those systems. But we understand that we need to manage that water get water back into a system as, as possible, but because of the challenges of this ridge line, uh, we have to address the fact that there are interbasin transfers, and they are not just a Metro Atlanta uh, issue. The reason why interbasin transfers become an issue for Metro Atlanta in particular, 99% of our water supply is surface water. We do not use groundwater in Metro Atlanta for water supply. And with that surface water, uh, the vast majority of it comes from the Chattahoochee Lanier system. Well, the thing about sewer systems is the utility directors like gravity flow. They don't want to pump things all around their counties and cities to return it from whence it came. And gravity flow, because of this ridge line, you'd have to pump it back over to get it back into the Lake Lanier Chattahoochee system. One of the things we talk about as the Metro Planning Organization is how to maximize return flows to the degree practical. So you have some excellent examples here in Gwinnett County with the F. Wayne Hill plant. Uh, where Gwinnett is, is spending the money to pump wastewater back to the F. Wayne Hill plant and then on to Lake Lanier. Uh, I always think of things in terms of water wars because that's what my job is. And having that return to the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint system is an enormous piece of what we're talking about. And when you hear stats about how much water Atlanta uses, there, there are two things you should really know. One, we return 65 to 70% of what's withdrawn from the system. So if you look at numbers on what's withdrawn, it's really only painting a piece of the picture, and you really need to look at the whole picture of what's returned into that same system. Um, the other thing, which uh, this has been, I, I started with ARC in January, and it started raining in January, whoever pointed out the rain. And, um, <laughs> but in March, we started with another round of water wars through Congress. And now it's moved to the newspapers. And you read in the newspapers pretty often now about how Metro Atlanta is to blame for the decline in the oyster population in Apalachicola Bay. Um, Boyd says boo. Uh, the one stat, if you take away one stat related to that, even in a very dry year, Metro Atlanta only uses 1% to 2% of the water in the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint system. And that 1% to 2% would not make a difference to the oysters in Apalachicola Bay. In fact, we have had some of the greatest droughts on record, and we have all suffered from these droughts on record. We have done our part from a water conservation standpoint. You heard Boyd say, per capita water demand is down 20%. That is one of the most aggressive programs in the country. 
So you can talk about interbase and transfers as one of the challenges we face, but we also have a lot of solutions on um, how we can move the process forward. And looking at water conservation and the positive story of Metro Atlanta is one thing that, as Boyd mentioned, he's made a call out to staff. I think that that's me and, and Danny. Um, to really get the message out there on the great things that Atlanta is doing and to counterbalance what the press may have shown as facts, but in fact, when you delve into it, uh, there's not quite the same level of fact that, that we have when we talk about water conservation and moving forward. Any other? Uh, Just to explain how it can change, when I became director of that same piece of property in 1996, we were permitting a facility and, and the discharge in the Chattahoochee wasn't feasible, so we were asked to pump the wastewater back across the ridge line and discharge in the Etowah Basin. And we were moving through the permitting process and EPD asked us to go over to uh, Rome area because it's going to end up in Lake Altoona and have a public hearing. So we went over a little bit naively and, and got attacked by about 200 people from the Lake Weiss area over in Alabama about putting wastewater in the Etowah River and in the Lake Altoona. And so they heavily opposed. It was a political season and somebody was running against Bob Barr. And I believe that's the year that the interbasin transfer bill got introduced. It ended up getting watered down, I believe, the Senate Bill 500 that uh, was going after it got tagged with the city of Atlanta's cleanup process. But today, some of those people who were opposed to us putting the wastewater back in Etowah because there was a little bit of a balancing act the state wanted to, to, uh, to correct. There was a Cobb County withdrawal that was coming out. And what we were actually be doing is returning some of the flow back to the original basin. Uh, but today, some of those people have, have openly uh, criticized us for not returning some of our flow back to the Etowah Basin. So in time, it's come full circle, and now they're asking for the water back. So in um, Charles Fishman's book, The Big Thirst, have any of you read that? Oh, you, you need to get a hold of it. Uh, Charles Fishman um, actually is, is uh, fairly negative on what Georgia has done. And uh, so you want to read it just for that reason, so that you can argue with him. And by the way, we're bringing him to the uh, University of Georgia on November 20th. He'll be at uh, that uh, late afternoon and evening. I don't know the exact time right now. He'll be at the chapel uh, speaking about the big thirst and, and water issues. But one of the things that he does is he talks about the first round of discussions related to the Tennessee River. And uh, so I, I think I'll start by putting Russ on, on the spot related to that and, and thoughts about actually bringing water from the Tennessee River into Georgia. Sure, thanks. Um, well, there's no doubt that the Tennessee River and the <coughs> drainage area that Georgia has that contributes to the flows in the Tennessee River is a great potential water supply for the state. I've seen numbers somewhere around 270 million gallons a day of the flow in the Tennessee River that comes from Georgia's drainage area. And I think when we look back to when we were dealing with the Magnuson uh, ruling and we were just pretty much desperate for where water was going to come from, the Tennessee River was an absolute interest for the state of Georgia as where we were going to go uh, as a solution. However, at the end of the day, Lake Lanier and Lake Alatoona cannot be replaced. And I think uh, that, that can't be avoided. We do have some issues coming up with the Water Quality Control Manual and the updates coming from the Corps of Engineers. But uh, just generally answering uh, as far as the Tennessee River and water supply solutions, the demand is not there, particularly for what the cost would be for the Tennessee River to get water here. Any other thoughts about Tennessee River? Jack? Um, whether, I, I would suggest that whether or not we need water from the Tennessee, um, I have a suspicion we will at some point. Um, but the, the key to it is let's not take alternatives off the table. Um, I think we, our, our approach so far with the Tennessee has not been all that great. It, we're already at war with Alabama and Florida. We're doing everything we can to avoid war with South Carolina over use of the, the, uh, the Savannah River. Firing a warning shot over the bow at Tennessee just to get them in, involved in the fray didn't seem like a, a real good approach to me. Um, but I, I do think we shouldn't take alternatives off the table. Um, we, we have a tendency to legislate sometimes 
uh, emotionally, and, and I would suggest that all of our uh, legislation needs to be based on uh, sound science. We have legislation on the table right now that prohibits, actually in place right now, that prohibits Metro Atlanta from looking at bringing in new sources from outside the district. And that, that kind of legislation is crippling and, and also is, is pits one Georgia against the other when we're all one Georgia. So, so regardless of the issue, let's, let's work to not take alternatives off the table. So before I open it up, uh, I want to make sure I get everybody uh, involved here. And so I'm going to pose this question to uh, Ron and Don. Stormwater is extremely important, and the handling of stormwater is extremely important. The question is, because stormwater runoff crosses multiple governmental jurisdictions, can you provide an insider's look at what it's like to manage these systems? Quite difficult. <laughs> when it because of jurisdictions, and in fact, we've got some mayors here uh, in Gwinnett County where their city actually receives drainage from Gwinnett County, flows through their city, and then back into the county again. Uh, through state legislation, uh, each entity, counties and cities, are required to uh, meet certain water quality uh, responsibilities as far as enforcement of uh, stormwater regulatory issues and it makes it very difficult when water no matter what the county does if the city is not enforcing all of its issues as well then when it comes back into the county it still is a problem we've got a number of streams in Gwinnett County that's on the 303d listing which means it's an impaired stream it does not meet its purposes and uh, so uh, anything that can be done including cooperation with our cities uh, to help remove some of these streams off the 303d list would would certainly uh, improve issues within Gwinnett County as well as within those cities related to stormwater um. <clears throat> As Jack said, stormwater is really where it's evolving the non-point source pollution uh, repairs. Gainesville has done several stream restoration projects over the last few years using 319 grant monies, but the city can clean up their portion of the stream and it flows into Hall County before it goes, flows into Lake Lanier. So uh, there is the, that, that issue. But I, the, right now in Gainesville, the Public Works Department actually does the stormwater management. Uh, over the next few years, I think you'll see it evolve into being a, a public utilities division of public utilities to, to manage the stormwater on a more comprehensive scale. But that's, that's where the trend's headed, no doubt. Anyone else want to address that question? So I have at least a dozen more questions here, uh, but uh, I think it's really important for us all to hear from, from you and of course, some of the questions are actually about what are the uh, sources of information for elected officials? Uh, you know, how can you find out about the best science, for example? Uh, how do you know about best management practices? So uh, I don't know what all is on your minds, but I think it's really important for us now to take the next half an hour or so for, for you to ask questions. And if you run out of steam, I, I still have the other dozen questions. So, so. Uh, Jump in, over here. Is groundwater <coughs> an option off the table? Over to Catherine. The question was about groundwater, and I'm gonna assume the question is related to the Metro Water District. Obviously, within the state of Georgia, groundwater is a huge supply uh, for the southern portion and the eastern portion of our state. When it comes to Metro Georgia, one of the things we're looking at is 99% of our water comes from surface water, but there is a viable groundwater source. It is just limited, and it is located in fractures. So it's not necessarily, if I decide to drill a well right here, would I find groundwater. So it's a challenge to find it at an appropriate level. But in certain places across the Metro District, there is groundwater as a source. A city of Roswell has wells, Lawrenceville has wells, city of East Point's looking at wells. So there is a viable source from groundwater. 
we just wouldn't expect to get the volume of water we need to serve the district as a whole. One of the things we're looking at with the next district plan is potentially using groundwater as an alternate supply in times of drought for emergency water supply for some of the smaller water supply reservoirs. So some of the cities and counties that have smaller water supply reservoirs, you could refill them in times of drought with groundwater with the system in place. You might be able to get two million gallons a day in an optimum situation out of groundwater, but it can help in that need. It will not supply the needs we have from Lake Lanier, but obviously it can help in certain instances. And to expound on that from a statewide perspective, I'd say there are two different areas that we should talk about. Number one being Savannah and the groundwater, I say Savannah, I really mean coastal Georgia and the groundwater use that's going on there. Um, you know, we're talking with South Carolina and currently there are friendly negotiations with South Carolina, but the water supply is, is a critical issue for both South Carolina and Georgia on the coast. And we're looking at various options, both with the core, with the harbor, and all the uh, activities going on in the Savannah Harbor, and um, the dissolved oxygen issues that have existed for years, and the water quality of the harbor. And that interrelates so well with groundwater uh, in that area. Most of uh, I mean, groundwater and the cost to produce drinking water from groundwater is so much lower for those municipalities. Uh, it, it's an incentive for them to use groundwater for their supply. However, they have surface water options. It's just kind of getting that mindset changed to going from groundwater to surface water. And also the customer's perspective in changing the cost structure in doing so. But uh, it, I would assume that over the next couple of decades there will be a shift to looking from groundwater to surface water on. Uh, the coastal area for uh, mitigation of the water quality issues that exist and then also in uh, working with South Carolina. And then if you go down to the southwestern part of the state, uh, staying in the Florida and aquifer, it, I mean it is a massive water supply, but your interaction between groundwater and surface water in the southwestern part of the state is just, I mean it, it's amazing. There are creeks such as Spring Creek in Calhoun County where literally there is a hole in the middle of the ground in the creek and it just disappears and turns directly into groundwater from surface water and then 200 yards downstream it reappears. Um, but because of that interaction between the groundwater and surface water and the historic droughts that have appeared over the last decade, everything has really been tested for water supply and going with agriculture and the largest industry in the state of Georgia. So. You know, there's a moratorium on new agricultural well permits out of the Florida aquifer. Uh, deeper aquifers such as the Clayton and Claiborne aquifers are some potential solutions for that. But uh, there's a lot of studying that needs to go on with that and how much production can come from that. But uh, there are just various different ways to look at groundwater versus surface water in different parts of the state. Ben Young with Georgia Trend Magazine. Uh, we've talked a little bit, uh, we've heard a little bit about storage in, in North Georgia and the mountains. How does that potentially play into the uh, treatment and um, backup sources of water and um, is the current um, IBT rules uh, sufficient to address uh, those, that kind of potential solution in the long term? The Metro Water District plans for water within the Metro Water District and we are legislatively driven to do that. We have plenty of supply from Lake Lanier and Lake Alatoona to supply our needs through uh, the, the planning horizon and, and into the future. So I'm going to answer the question for reservoirs within the Metro Planning District. Uh, one of the things we look at is we're in the middle of a water control manual update by the Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers is going to come out in approximately two years with a number theoretically, that they will give Georgia for water supply out of Lake Lanier. So this is Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint Basin. We don't know what that number will be. The state of Georgia has asked for 705 MGD. Of that 705, 660 is for the metro Atlanta region. If the Corps were to come out with a number smaller than that, we're going to need additional storage in order to supply our needs. And that's why some of these reservoirs you see going on now within the district are important because we don't have a way of knowing which direction the core is going to land. Ideally, they will say, you know what, you asked for 660, but we're going to give you 665. 
I doubt that will happen. The thing about reservoirs is it takes decades to plan, permit, and build them. So if we don't start that today, or really 10 years ago, then when the Corps comes out with an answer or when a lawsuit from Florida drives a decision, we need to have that in place and moving forward in order to have the water supply for the future. So although we know we have enough from Lake Lanier and Lake Alatoona and the additional sources across Metro Atlanta, I think it behooves us from a planning perspective and looking out for the future to make sure that we have a backup plan in case additional reservoirs are needed moving forward. Russ says I answered it perfectly. You know, it might be good just for a minute uh, to give a little bit of background on the uh, Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint River Basin controversy and the, you know, the, the 25 year battle over that because I'm not sure everybody's on the same page with that. Sure. I'm not going to talk too much history because I think many of you have lived through the last, um, at least the recent history of the 11th Circuit Court ruling that metropolitan Atlanta can get withdrawals from Lake Lanier. What they're looking at now is how much of a withdrawal we can get. What's happened in August is that the, uh, Governor Scott in Florida has threatened to sue Georgia. I am an engineer, I am not a lawyer, so we'll start with that. I'm not gonna comment upon the legal side of that. Uh, we also can't comment on the legal side of that because the lawsuit hasn't been filed yet. But I can talk a little bit about process and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have that I might know the answer to. Uh, the state of Florida has threatened an equitable apportionment lawsuit against the state of Georgia. It's basically saying we are taking too much water and not sending enough downstream. As you heard me say earlier, in times of drought, everybody is suffering. It is not a Georgia versus Florida issue. Nonetheless, they believe that we are to blame for oyster declines in Apalachicola Bay, and therefore they have claimed uh, that they will sue this month. So sometime in September, we are waiting with bated breath. Um, NOAA issued a disaster declaration for the oysters in Apalachicola Bay a day before a Senate hearing on the oysters in Apalachicola Bay. That disaster declaration is the first step in an equitable apportionment lawsuit because Flor Florida can claim harm. They don't, have to cl they don't have to show that we are the cause of the harm. They just have to show that there is harm and therefore they can sue. It goes straight to the Supreme Court because it is an interstate water dispute. The past lawsuit was against the Corps of Engineers and that's why it felt played out through the federal court system. But because this is an interstate water dispute, it goes straight to the Supreme Court. There's a question as to whether the Supreme Court would take it, but we expect that they will. Uh, most recently, South Carolina sued North Carolina. Same issue, equitable apportionment, this time for the Catawba River. And that was taken by the Supreme Court. That one is one of the few cases that's Eastern water rights related. Most of the Supreme Court cases have been Western. That one, in three and a half years, they still had not gotten to the Supreme Court. They were still in the initial stages of the process when South Carolina and North Carolina settled out of court. We would expect the process to be roughly 10 years, so we're not talking about a quick solution to the issue. Um, that said, we are preparing heavily today to make sure that we have the best teams available and on our, on our side to help with this lawsuit. And that's not just the lawyer side, but also the technical side. And um, I mentioned I started this job in January. One of the nice things I find about this job is we definitely have the data and the facts on our side. And so it helps to be um, fighting a battle when we, when we feel like we're on the, the winning side of that battle. But it, it would be a 10-year process. It starts with a special master. Uh, the Supreme Court identifies somebody that arguments really go before the special master before it even makes the Supreme Court. Um, but to, to Mayor Austin, I now know the 10 years ahead of me in my career at ARC. Can you elaborate a little bit the lawsuit law case has already been filed and it's going on for a 10-year process? What happens in the interim? It, does the water, you know, Atlanta continues to grow? Do we have the rights to that water during that period? Any idea on that? We are expecting that the Corps of Engineers will continue their work on the water control manual. And like I mentioned before, in a couple years, we're expecting a number to come from the Corps on what Atlanta could use. Uh, so we're hoping that that process continues at the same pace, and in a couple years, we'll have that answer. The lawsuit in the long run might change that answer, but that would be where we are uh, two years from now. You will always hear me talk about water conservation, though. Um, it is an important tool, and it is at the cost of our water utilities, because our water utilities, uh, you know, they're, they're 
in the business, per se, of selling water. And their capital costs are fixed, regardless of how much water they sell. So some of the things Metro Atlanta is doing, which has been great for our region and great from the water stewardship and making sure we are taking care of the water that flows through our region, is really at the cost of, a, of our um, water utilities because they're selling less water because we've done such a great job of getting that message out. Other questions? Uh, Ron, you mentioned earlier about uh, the stormwater between county and city and city and county, which would, would, which would be applicable throughout the, the water district. Tell us some things that we can do to help be sure that we're, we're taking care of that. Um, well, I would certainly recommend that there be a continuing dialogue and communication between the city's stormwater programs and the county's programs so that if there's a, and, and we have actually undertaken some stream bank restoration projects within a number of the cities uh, for that purpose uh, because the stream that's being uh, repaired, if you will, uh, lies in both jurisdictions. And, uh, and I think that's something that needs to continue to happen. Uh, there also, I guess the county would certainly welcome some uh, uh, both technical as well as uh, financial support as well to, as, on some of those programs. Uh, but it's all a matter of controlling the stormwater to meet uh, certain permit requirements, the permit for this uh, plant right here, uh, which in fact serves Norcross as well, and, and a number of other cities. Uh, uh, the permit for this plant uh, includes a requirement in the NPDES permit that a certain amount of stream bank restoration projects occur. Dialogue is one thing, but uh, you know, how can we really uh, you know, I, I know some cities don't do uh, stormwater, and some cities do. So, uh, and it not, not just in Gwinnett County, because we got the whole region uh, uh, here. What, I mean, what would bring this particular issue to a level where people would pay attention to it and, and, and be able to make a, affect change in a positive way? I think you've gotten a suite of ordinances that the Metro District You do. Has. Right. That, uh, that was the one thing I was going to say what Mayor Austin mentioned is that the Metro District has uh, model ordinances that uh, the counties have to comply with as well as the cities. And uh, those ordinances actually, there's one of the uh, plans in the district is for uh, uh, stormwater. And so... Uh, I would think that the one thing that we could do is that, like I mentioned earlier, is that we not only have a dialogue, but we actually enter into planning efforts together. Uh, now, one of those planning efforts could be uh, that the cities join with the county in the stormwater utility. Uh, and that offer is out there. <coughs> it's, it's been there before. And then uh, it'd be one organization that's responsible for that. But that's just one, one solution. When it comes to stormwater, it's not just a Georgia issue, it's a nationwide issue. One of the things we have to address is the management of stormwater. And when you talk about water supply, it's all interrelated. You have water and wastewater and stormwater as a cycle. One of the challenges that we are currently crossing in Georgia is stormwater utilities. Not every government has a stormwater utility. There was a question even in the last legislative session that got into stormwater utilities about whether it's a, a tax or a fee. Um, as water providers, we see a lot of value in stormwater utilities. One of the benefits in having it in a tax bill is the fact that then the collections are so much higher. And so you have, I think the stat is a 99% capture rate on that fee, which helps the stormwater utility. You have a lot of homeowners associations that are putting in detention systems that then need to be maintained. And that's one of the drivers for stormwater utilities. 
managing that stormwater system to make sure we are capturing our flow and appropriately treating it is important to the metro region across from the water quality to the water quantity standpoint. But having the fees in place in order to do that is important to make it work. And right now it's a, it's a, a variety of methods that counties and cities are using um, and to, eat, to differing effects, right? So some folks have a, water, have a fee on a water and wastewater bill and that's how they're collecting money for a stormwater utility. Some cities and counties have no stormwater utility at all and that causes challenges too. But it's, it's become a, a city by county uh, way of managing it and at some point I think we're gonna need to d address this as a region on how we're gonna address our stormwater and, and move that forward from a water supply, water quality standpoint. And it, it'll be a complicated discussion, but something we need to cross. Um, it's similar, as Mayor Austin said, we have these model stormwater ordinances that cities and counties uh, can and sometimes must implement. We're gonna have to bring that dialogue forward when it comes to utilities and what we need as a region to address our stormwater. Mark has a question. Yeah, well, th this is a great question. I, you may have just answered it as part of that, but to me, one of the, the biggest benefits of the state water planning effort was that we've begun integrating water supply with water treatment and managing it both quantity and quality at the same time. Uh, you know, I think we've done a lot with conservation, but it seems like there's low-hanging fruit in terms of green infrastructure, rainwater harvesting, technologies that work to reduce both, you know, both help you on the water quality side, as well as putting more water into the shallow aquifers to recharge those streams during drought periods so that droughts don't hurt as much. And so I guess I'm interested, what are y'all doing to promote those types of practices in addition to uh, conservation. Russ may want to answer from a statewide perspective. Yeah. From a district perspective, we have three plans. We have a water plan, water supply and conservation, a wastewater management plan, and a water resources, which is really a stormwater plan. We're about to enter our next round of planning, and one of the things we're driving towards is integrated water resources planning. So pulling those three together and looking at the interaction between them all. Um, you mentioned green infrastructure. That's another piece of the puzzle moving forward. It's not just putting stormwater in a concrete channel and, and moving it away from your site, but looking at water quality and water quantity and how best to manage that stormwater from a collective practice. And there are a lot of different innovative technologies that are coming out from a green infrastructure and other that need to be evaluated as part of the planning process. And that's one of the things we're working towards at, at the district. Sure, and uh, you know, the district is well ahead of the 10 other regional water councils that were created, but uh, you know the legislature took a big step this past year in funding the other 10 regional water councils, which is enough to get them back under track. Um, the feedback that we've gotten from those other regional water councils, though, is that for the first time, the groups are talking with each other. So the upstream user knows what the downstream user's doing and how they're impacted and vice versa. And so we're looking at a way to keep that going and, and continuing the effort. And we're getting uh, feedback. State of South Carolina is very interested in how our regional water councils are working and are wanting to copy our efforts there. So I, I think that is a positive thing. And the discussion that we've been having so far between water quality, water supply, it, it is interrelated. And when we're looking at um, issuing permits and the studies that go into the individual permits, we're looking at the land use and the future land use and, and how that water quality and runoff is impacting the water, uh, the surface water or groundwater. And, and all of that's going into the planning efforts, not just here in Atlanta, but statewide and the regional water councils are a big part of that. Other questions? Yes, I have a question about uh, in the wastewater area, in the Metro Planning District, what is the percentage of wastewater that's treated still by septic? And how is that overseen and, and how does that impact your water strategies when you're trying to balance uh, consumption against uh, return flows? I don't have a percentage. I don't know if Ron Peters or, or Tim has a percentage. It is certainly a discussion um, that we are moving forward. It's important to note that although we 
we collectively have treated septic tanks as a loss to the system, there is a return flow associated with that because it does flow typically through groundwater, um, that surficial aquifer, into our streams and into our lakes. Um, so certainly it's a part of the conversation, but when we talk about the challenges of Metro Atlanta, there are parts of the, of the region that septic systems just become a reality because of this pumping concern. We can't necessarily have pumps in everybody's house, you know, especially if you take like some of the lakes where you have to pump up. You would have to have a pump in everybody's house in order to get it out. That said, moving forward, many of our cities and counties are working to make sure that it's sewered, that we're treating it to a high level, because then we can manage that. We have more direct control over the management of it and more direct control over to where it is going and, and how we are reusing it. Um, there's another issue with septic tanks that has become a challenge that we're starting to deal with moving forward, and that's the maintenance of septic tanks. Uh, there is no current regulation for septic tanks um, I think Douglasville, Douglas County has a regulation that they must be maintained and uh, residents must send manifests in saying that it was pumped out every X number of years and then it was returned to a wastewater treatment plant that accepts septage. But that's not district-wide and it's certainly not statewide and it's one of the things we're moving towards is the proper maintenance of those from a water quality perspective because when they fail, that is going directly into our streams and lakes too. It's not just a return flow, but it's a return flow. Um, one of the challenges there is not all of the wastewater treatment plants in the region accept that pump out. And so sometimes we find that it's not being discharged properly. And so we're working towards making sure that that's in place to make sure that when people do take the initiative to pump out their septic tank, it then ends up in the proper place. That's a question to my knowledge and how that's changing. So, uh, currently, the Department of Public Health manages or regulates septage, and that is changing, and it got legislatively extended, but EPD will inherit the regulations on septage as of July of 2014. Um, with that, we're looking at some rule changes and how to manage it. Um, specifically, and, and I'll let some of the utility guys comment on this, it's how to promote septage, um, I guess proper maintenance of septage, as Catherine was saying, so that things are priced correctly, so we have septage haulers going to the point source discharges where it can be controlled and going to places that can take it correctly, as opposed to, well, I'm not gonna go pay this utility to treat my septage, I'm gonna go down a dirt road and spray it into a tree or put it in a storm drain or mm. anywhere else. <laughs> Um, we're actually going to work with the Georgia Association of Water Professionals. Um, we're, we're trying to work out details right now, but have them help us for coming up with some standards on identifying what facilities can handle it uh, and, and working for some really, I guess, standard operating procedures statewide as uh, how to have everything priced correctly. And, and with that, there's a, you know, every year septage tends to at least be whispered as a potential piece of legislation that could be introduced. Uh, we are working with some of those constituents and working with the rules and how to have everything set correctly in order to treat septage. And I would suggest that the issue goes further back. Um, we need to start planning uh, and have some coordination between the people that are permitting septic tanks and the people that are responsible for treating the septage when it's, uh, when it's, when it's uh, generated or when, it, when it's pumped. Um, county health departments are responsible for permitting septic tanks and they generally will permit them. Um, I've gotten one approved myself and it, it was like the guy was gonna figure out a way to permit that septic tank no matter what. <laughs> um, knowing full well that at some point it was gonna, 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 uh, gonna fail or have to be pumped. There's no such thing, I think, as a septic tank that'll ne never have to be pumped. So with that said, there needs to be a full accounting for it so that in the planning stages, when you're putting in a, 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 a development or whatever on septage, on septic tanks, we need to have a provision for what's gonna happen when we, when we have to pump it eventually. Um, and the, the whispers of legislation are, are come from, in large part, from the septage haulers who think they're being charged too much um, and, and the whispers are things like, 
I'll just find a creek to dump it in or I'll find a manhole to, to dump it in. And what they don't understand is the people that have their septic tanks pumped maybe every five years, four to five years, the cost that they have to, to bear for that, that disposal is far less than if they've been paying a sewer bill for the, the four or five years. Um, and I think Douglas Hill Douglas County has some creative ways to, to make people understand that. So we, uh, um, I may be wrong, but Pete might want to answer that as well. Yeah, we hear from these haulers a lot also. Uh, Got to keep in mind, not every plant can handle that septage. That's some strong stuff. Uh, it can foul a plant real quickly. So uh, getting discharge and illegal discharge into the wrong system, though, can, can really mess us up. So we do have to find a way to receive it fair prices. But I know I, I was uh, told from a friend of mine in Cherokee County that they, they recognize some septage coming in from Alabama all the way to Cherokee County and being discharged at their facility because their rates were really low. They had to correct that. So it is a big issue. There are some innovative ways out there to address it. Uh, getting back to the question of how much, I, I don't have a number how many uh, of our systems still on septic, but obviously some of our original development was on septic. But we are planning on uh, being able to take that in in the years to come and converting those over to, uh, to a sewer system but we still do have a large amount of, uh, of septage customers. All of our new development though, with a ruling I think or guidance from the district, if you're within 5,000 feet of a sewer system, you're required to tie on to uh, public sewer and not uh, develop on septic. Um, of Gwinnett's 250,000 water customers, we have about 80,000 septic tanks in Gwinnett County, large number of that. And yet, um, we only have one plant that can receive septage, and that's our Crooked Creek plant down in uh, Norcross. Uh, and Gwinnett is not unique in that, but the fact that Gwinnett even has a place to treat septage is unique. Uh, there are other places, other counties all around the state that have no place to treat septage. And uh, in fact, we had to go to a manifest system to uh, have the haulers actually demonstrate that the septage that they were bringing in at the plant there belonged in Gwinnett County because we had so many people that were bringing it in at one point in time from outside the county. Now, an interesting thing about that, and it's a lot of it is driven by cost. Um, at one point in time, Gwinnett had some of the cheapest rates around for treating septage, and uh, we got it from everywhere. Uh, we raised the rates, and suddenly the numbers of haulers coming into that plant went way down. Well, we knew they were going somewhere, there's not too many places outside of the county to, to take it, so we figured they're finding a, a manhole somewhere to discharge it. Uh, so we ramped up our enforcement programs, and we've taken quite a few haulers to court as a result of it. Um, as Tim said, the septage is incredibly strong uh, compared to normal wastewater that's flowing in the, in the system. And uh, it's like having a big slug of high strength wastewater hit those plants all at one time when those uh, trucks discharge. And so uh, charging for it, it's appropriate to charge higher rates for that. And yet if we charge too much, we're concerned that the folks are out there finding manholes to discharge to. So it's a, there's a balancing act. I can say that Gainesville several years ago actually did the math on the concentration of the septage and trying to figure out the, the, the cost to treat that compared to regular sewerage and they set the price accordingly, uh, which is probably prohibitive to most haulers in Hall County. But uh, that's what we had to do. It's a real, it represents a real cost to the, to the utility. So we're, we're beginning to run up against uh, our time. I would like uh, Mayor Austin to go ahead and uh, speak and then we'll, we'll wrap it up.
And Senator, Senator, Senator Unterman would like to ask a question as well, so I'm going to okay. give her that time. But what I want to say to the elected officials in the room is that we talk about the state funding the other 10 water councils last year. The amount of state funding for the metro district and the water councils is minimal. There is a per capita fee paid by each county in the water district that is about four times, amounts of four times the state contribution, is that right? In our annual budget. And when we have to go through the state mandated plan update, we will have to pay an additional amount of money. We have in the past sought and been provided some additional state funding, but the people in the district are bearing the cost. And when we talk about stormwater utilities and stormwater treatment, um, when we talk about extending sewer to areas that have high uh, septic uh, concentration, all of that is a cost to the taxpayer of the utility. You heard Catherine say that our conservation has reduced water usage, and so much of our <coughs> systems were built on a uh, income model prior to that, so we've actually cut into the amount of income. We don't have additional monies a lot of times in our utilities for extensions. So it's a balancing act on who's paying for what. One other point I want to make about stormwater is that in the past few years, both the State Department of Agriculture and the State Department of Transportation have challenged uh, local stormwater utilities that they wanted to be exempt from. So we're required by the state to put, put a certain quality of water in the system, and we have two very large state agencies that want to be exempt from it. So we need to, make, we need to level the playing field we need to understand that there is a significant cost to all of us, uh, in, in individual counties, but as a state as well, sure, and all the money that we've expended uh, in these lawsuits over the last 25 years and what may be another 10-year protracted uh, legal battle. So, Senator, I'll let you ask your question. So, uh, Senator, uh, uh, go ahead and, and uh, address the uh, panel and then We'll have to take only, you know, like three minutes or so to respond, and then. Mine's well, just a quick question. Um, I think it's for about the last four years we've had a bill on stream buffers, and it's always by legislators from the North Georgia Mountain area, and uh, it it evolves around what constitutes a ditch or a gully, and if it's an active stream or if it's a stream during rainy seasons or whatever. <laughs> I was just wondering if the planning district had taken a stance on it because uh, every time it's presented, it's uh, just kind of like a free-for-all. The district has implemented stream buffer ordinances across the district that are required and, and um, variances from the streams. To the, to the specific question, though, about this um, draft bill that's come, the district has not taken a legislative stance. Most of the bills that come through, we're just tracking. We do occasionally take a stance. That's not to say, though, that uh, we're not a source for answers moving forward. Um, because although we may not have an official position written uh, that we're sending a letter to you and letting you know what we think, uh, we're technically looking at all the issues. And, and we know, you know we can explain what's been done within the district and, and what the, the broader issues are. Does that answer briefly enough your question? So I'd like to suggest that you can continue your dialogue with the panel uh, over lunch, and I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Steve. Thank you, Dan. Let's uh, give our panel and the, and the dean a hand.